Hey everyone, uh, I'm Eve. I'm the CEO of uh, Fieldwire, and I'm here today with uh, Peter Shaliko, uh, who's the general manager at Chaffron Construction, uh, and Ray, of course, our head of marketing. Uh, so Peter and his team just wrapped up a TI project for a large hospital in Portland, uh, and he's also involved with design and pre-construction on two uh, COVID-19 response projects. And so we're going to go a little bit in the specifics of uh, of what those projects are about. Uh, so we're looking forward to talking to uh, to him uh, about that. So Peter, first of all, thanks for joining us. Uh, before we jump into uh, some question about your projects, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself uh, and, and Shaffron Construction? So Shaffron Construction is um, a family owned uh, small construction company uh, that's been working for about three decades uh, on specialty tenant improvement projects uh, mainly at Oregon Health Sciences University uh, on their main and satellite campuses. And I joined the company a couple of years ago um, after I sold a, a different business and uh, been learning a lot about construction and a lot about healthcare construction. What, uh, what's defining about, about being a, a, a family-driven construction business? Well, I think, you know, we're a small team, we're a collaborative team. Uh, we have a certain set of values and, and a commitment to the institution that we work at. And, and I think when you're doing sustaining work in an institutional environment like that, you kind of need to have, you need to be somewhat purpose driven. That, that makes sense. And Peter, what's uh, just, just for the rest of our listeners, what's the situation like in Portland now as it relates to COVID-19? I think similar to what we were discussing about uh, what's happening in San Francisco, I think we did social distancing because of the example of Seattle. Social distancing came in early here. Uh, I think that you know, everybody talks about bending the curve down. I think somewhat the curve has been bent down. Um, and it seems like, you know, the city overall is responding well, the caseload and the, the caseload at the hospitals probably is at the lower end of what they what they expected, but everybody is really staying home. And you, I know you just, uh, and we're gonna talk about that in a minute, I know that you've been working on a healthcare project there. How has the rest of construction in Portland been impacted? Are, are all projects still going or are they trying to categorize essential projects? We just have anecdotal evidence. Um, most of the people, we, most of the subs we work with are in healthcare. Um, we met with some of them uh, earlier this week to look at some COVID response projects, and they said that all of their healthcare stuff has really basically dried up. I do know anecdotally that uh, there are people working on school projects because schools are empty, so I think some of that work has been accelerated. Um, but I don't know, you know, uh, the governor of Oregon did deem construction and essential activity. So I think projects, when you, if you do drive around, you do see projects large and small continuing to a certain extent. Yeah, I mean, I think if we look at the numbers, I think the West Coast reacted very early uh, to the, to the COVID-19 epidemic. So we don't have quite as big of a capacity issue yet in hospitals as maybe New York, for example. Um, so that's a good transition. I think, uh, as, Jay, as Ray was saying, you, you just wrapped up a, a healthcare project for, for a client. Can you, can you tell us a little bit more about what, what that project was about and, um, and how it relates to the current situation, maybe? Yeah, that, that project wasn't COVID-related. That was a, a, a project in, uh, in a healthcare space uh, in the hospital. Uh, but it was a research project that we were already working on. And we made the decision as a team to... Uh, shut that project down earlier than we got direction from the hospital that they were on modified operations because we felt like we had to figure out uh, what we were gonna do for our team and our subcontractors. We got that uh, in terms of safety in response to COVID. We worked on that, we figured that out. We resumed that project last week and we wrapped it up today. Uh, and we'll have inspections on Monday. The client, is all the client teams working remotely now. So it's an empty space essentially. <laughs> Interesting. So what were some of the, the, the critical decision factors then uh, that you guys considered when after shutting down the project to be like, what do we need to figure out to be able to resume work? So we obviously, the, the first consideration is how do we keep our team members safe? 
uh, and what what were the procedures and processes that we needed to you know to implement to do that, and what were the liabilities that we faced, what were the dangers that we faced, how did we how do we get guys on a job site to actually work? How do we uh, how do we get subs on the job site? How do people interact? And so obviously you kind of start at the top and you realize, depending on the size of the space, and this was a small project, kind of important, so it's a small space, you can't stack any of your subs. Each trade has to, so you're kind of lengthening your schedule, stretching it out a little bit. Um, and luckily, while we were trying to make this decision, we were looking at a project at a, at a uh, an off-site surgery center and we had to go and look at it and when we went when we went to look at it they uh, made us sign in and they took our birth dates and our name took our temperatures so we immediately ordered thermometers <laughs> yeah okay, well that's a good idea um and so it's it's just kind of this evolutionary process it's iterative and you're just kind of taking best practices from everybody and we put together a document that we gave to our subs and then got feedback from them just a follow up there, Peter, because it's it's interesting to hear this, and we've heard it from a lot of other a lot of other um, companies we've been talking to. It sounds like there just there really wasn't a playbook for this. You you had to kind of piece it together from those firsthand experiences and interactions. What other than the example you gave us about the thermometers, was there any place that you were able to find a, a rich amount of information and best practices? Like, did you have one colleague at another company, or, or was it truly pieced together? It was pieced together uh, on really from our team working together, and then we do get guidance from the uh, the excellent safety team, uh, construction safety team at Oregon Health Sciences University, Gene Patrick and his team. So we dialogue with them. We get the hospital protocols. Um, we get all that information, uh, and, and we have an open conversation with them. But it was really kind of thinking through it and trying to be logical about it and, and seeing what made sense in terms of safety. And the one point I would make is we started to bring this up early with our team and because it's construction, um, with a little bit of machismo, I would say, you know, oh, you're, well, you're overreacting. You know, I came in to the office one day, maybe three weeks ago, or I can't even remember time, but, you know, with bottles of Lysol and rags and gloves and, you know, I was, wiping handles and, and my colleagues were kind of dismissive of that, you know, it's just, and as maybe all of us were in some ways. It's, uh, it, it's really interesting because I think the, the situation has been a driving force for uh, mentalities to evolve quite a bit. I think there's a tendency, as you said, to pirate through stuff in construction and yes, you're sick, but you're still showing up on site because the work has to get done. Um, and in, in this situation, I think it's, it's maybe creating a, a, a bit more balance and, and, it's making people more comfortable with, uh, with, with talking about those subjects. I think we see the same thing on the, on the technology front right now where some companies are using that as a force to change how they're doing things. Uh, because yes, part of their crews are, are, are remote or, or they're operating with uh, reduced crews on site, so they need to be more efficient. So it's a, it's a very interesting uh, uh, evolution for us for the industry right now. Great. Peter, in addition to the healthcare project that you just wrapped up today, you mentioned to me that you're working on um, two COVID-19 response projects as well. Um, and I think you mentioned that you're in the design and pre-construction pre phase with those. Could, could you, for me, I don't know much about what a COVID-19 response project would look like. Could you just walk us through like what, what those are and how you're going about that? Yeah, so, <clears throat> um... The project we're working on, the one project we're, we're really focused on, we have daily meetings on, is um, a telemedicine program, uh, basically a virtual ICU, that we were, we were awarded that project, um, the pre-construction, we started working on that in January before any of this arose. And so obviously as the response to COVID, as a response to COVID-19, that project has been accelerated. So we were having daily meetings with the design team um, and kind of through that process, trying to figure out how we can design, build, permit, <laughs> accelerate everything. The project was originally supposed to be delivered in September. Now we're trying to move that delivery up to July. And so a lot of what we run into um, 
if you have to go outside of the normal process, right? So the city of Portland has been great. They've come up with uh, uh, an alternative kind of an accelerated COVID project permitting process. They've tiered all of their permitting. They have tier one, tier two, tier three, tier four. Tier one is all hospital work. But even within tier one, if it's COVID, uh, they're turning around permits within three or four hours. Wow. Yeah. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a big change. What a, so I think this is really interesting because we're, we're seeing once again, the situation being a driving force that impacts really just, you know, common design build processes here. What, what are other ways other than permitting that, that has helped you kind of like accelerate the process uh, right now? Well, what we're trying to do is, is figure out ways to, you know, split the project into, you know, we usually wait until we had full design documents and go in and just build everything. And we're trying to figure out what can we do uh, in terms of infrastructure. So in terms of all the MEP work, what can we piece out and just get guys working on? Because again, we can't trade stack. We can't get people into this space as many people as we would want to, because we have to social distance. We have to start looking at things and saying, okay, if you're going to have a crew of more than one person in there, mm -hmm. uh, how can you perform this work? How can we do it? And so we, we're trying to figure out ways to get people in early, mm -hmm. and kind of chop the job up a little bit more. It's, it's inefficient in a certain way, right? Um, but it's kind of what we have to do. Um, and then we have to obviously look at supply chains, lead times. Uh, that's a constant issue in the design now. Is this product, is this finished, you know, is this flooring available now? It's available now. Um, or we had another project that we just started looking at for COVID response. Somebody bought all the flooring at, at, at the distributor in Oregon. Mm -hmm. Foresaw this coming, bought all the flooring we would have wanted. So then our uh, sub looking at a vendor in Arizona. Yeah, yeah. So uh, if we go into supply chain a little bit, because I think it's a, it's a very relevant subject, because even if we're keeping the projects going, if, if you can't find your, your materials, like it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to cause issue. Are you seeing specific types of things that you're running out of, or you've been able, as you said, to replace with a, a different supplier in a different state? We haven't seen it. You know, we haven't gotten to the design, to, to the part in the design where we've been specific. So if we look at, you know, obviously it's a large institution, so there are building specific finishes for mm -hmm. each. Building. Yeah. So what we started with was, uh, here are the building standards. When we look at the building standards, we have the vendors check, you know, we have the, uh, the vendors check on a, on a repetitive basis, and we still kind of have these lead times. But the caveat with everything is always, it depends. Mm -hmm. uh, what happens with manufacturing? What happens with the supply chain? You know, many, many things are made overseas and shipped here. So we're looking at what the inventory is, what the stock is at a facility somewhere across the country. What happens with trucking after that? And so I think in regard to the projects we're working on, it's more there's kind of a, a matrix being put together by the design team based on uh, the building standard finishes and then the availability, the pricing, and the unknowns kind of. Yeah. I'm just trying to land on things and see how it works. I don't know how it's going to work. Okay. So it, as, as a company, I think uh, Shafran is very focused on, on healthcare to start with. So it makes sense for you uh, to focus on uh, COVID response projects. Uh, is that is that like a like a company strategy right now to 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 go on bids for those projects? Uh, is is that a very specific market? What what kind of volume do you see uh, in in COVID response projects compared to like what would be the normal activity of the company? Well, I mean, most of our normal projects in the healthcare environment are uh, are shut down. Okay. That's, uh, you know, as I said, we're, we mainly work with one institution and we are in the process of expanding, but most of those have been put on a hiatus as the institution looks for funding, right? I mean, they're, it's a very complex situation where healthcare institutions are focused almost solely on COVID. Their costs for that go up, all their elective procedures are gone, so their revenue goes down. Um, so they put a hold on uh, myriad construction projects across mm -hmm. the institution. 
So really, um, except for some compliance projects that we have, COVID is what we're responding to. And we're just responding to the need uh, of the institution and the project managers who reach out to us. There's not a formal, I think that what will happen is we will, there will be uh, growth in COVID response programs as we return to normal because um, we're starting, you know, a situation like this exposes the cracks in the, uh, in the dike, so to speak, and you have to go back and repair these things or come up with a strategy to mm -hmm. for when this happens next. That, that makes a ton of sense because I think one of, the, one of the, the big subjects right now as this is becoming the new normal is to switch our attention to the recovery phase, which is expected to actually be quite long. And so we're, we're talking about building sustainable capacity to handle the, the, the long tail of, of, of COVID being around for, I don't know, maybe months, like maybe most of activities resuming, but having the capacity to handle it uh, on, the, on the healthcare side. Um, so so that, makes a, that makes a lot of sense. I wasn't aware about the point you just made that, that, that most large, large health, healthcare facilities have, have seen their costs go up very significantly, but at the same time, uh, a very significant part of their revenue uh, not not being impacted in as quite a positive way. Uh, so even those essential operations, um, having having to shut down, uh, like for example, the, the the work they're doing on on some of their facilities. Um, is there anything that 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 you could share beyond actually that 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 great piece of knowledge that that would benefit our audience at a, on a, on, a, on a broader sense? Maybe something that uh, you've done as a company that that you thought was really a good move. Or, or a right decision over the, the last few weeks? I think, you know, not, nothing earth shattering or s specific, but I think what this kind of event does is it makes you refocus on your values uh, mm -hmm. as a team and your culture and think about what you're trying to accomplish and how you're trying to accomplish it. And one of the great things about the company is that, as I said, you know, it's a family company with, with strong values and it's strong values about taking care of our clients taking care of our partners and taking care of obviously our employees above above and beyond all uh, and so i think you know you don't want to say that this 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 has been a good thing um in a certain sense but it's just reinforced why we do what we do how we try and do it and mm -hmm. i think you know and how we value the people we work with and we work for and i think that's what we're you know it's just a reminder just a reminder. And we all need to uh, work to help each other. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's the, the best way to, uh, to, to finish this discussion. Once again, when the situation changes, when the company has to adapt, the one thing that remains constant is the values. Uh, and that's what you can align people on. Uh, so that makes a ton of sense. Uh, Peter, thanks very much uh, for being with us today. Uh, once again, surprisingly, valuable content that comes out of those those short discussion and and uh looking forward uh, to talking more thanks very much eve thanks ray thanks peter bye-bye